Welcome to this first of multiple installments in which we'll discuss Chapter 12's coverage of the structure of solids. As I think about solids, it reminds me, back after I graduated from high school, I worked and lived for a summer in the town of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. During the daytime, I worked for eight hours a day cleaning hotel rooms, and then at night I had a second job working eight hours a night doing dishes at a restaurant. I have a special relationship and deep love for Wyoming. Both of my parents are natives from Wyoming, but moved to Utah before I was born. Wyoming is an interesting state. Because I have so many family members there, I grew up traveling there frequently to visit grandparents, uncles, cousins, and aunts. As a typical kid, when we traveled to Wyoming, I would often say, are we in Wyoming yet? Are we in Wyoming yet? Are we in Wyoming yet? One time as I was traveling with my parents and one of my uncles toward Wyoming, my uncle finally got tired of me asking that incessant question and said, Mike, look out the window. What do you see? I looked out the window and said, I don't see anything. And indeed, that was the case. As far as the eye could see, there were vast expanses of desert without trees, bushes, or almost anything in sight. When I told him that I saw nothing, he looked at me and said, yes, we are in Wyoming. To start, I wanted to call attention to something really interesting taken from our text. It says, the hard drive of a computer is made from an extremely smooth glass disk coated with a thin layer of magnetic alloy of cobalt. To store and retrieve information, the read-write head must glide over the disk at a height of one micrometer, less than one two hundredth the width of a human hair, while the disk moves at speeds in excess of 7,000 RPMs. Devices such as this would not be possible without advanced solid-state materials. My point in reading this to you is that the chemistry of solids is very important, and indeed each of us has been affected in modern society by it. After today's presentation, you guys should be able to have memorized the five different types of solids that we'll cover in lecture with their basic characteristics, identify the attractive forces in those different types of solids, identify molecules with metallic properties, know what a unit cell is, identify a compound's lattice type and empirical formula from a picture of its unit cell, and if given a polymer structure, draw the monomers used to make it. And please note that we will skip sections 6, 7, and 9 from the text. With that said, let's get started. There are six different types of solids. Metallic solids, ionic solids, covalent network solids, molecular solids, polymers, and nanomaterials. We won't discuss nanomaterials in this class. We'll discuss polymers, however, later on. First are metallic solids. Metallic solids are really just solid metals. If you were to look very, very closely at solid metals, what you would see is that they look like delocalized seas of electrons floating around little islands that are their individual nuclei. This reality allows metals to conduct electricity, but also to be strong while not brittle. Examples include copper and iron, as well as most of the other crap on the periodic table. Now to ionic solids. Ionic solids are held together by strong attractions between cations and anions. Their electrical and mechanical properties are much different from those of metals. Generally speaking, ionic compounds do not conduct electricity. Examples include sodium chloride and magnesium oxide. These contrast with covalent network solids, which are held together by an extended network of covalent bonds, not metallic or ionic bonds. This bonding type can make materials very hard, such as diamond, which is a covalent network of carbon atoms. It also gives semiconductors their properties. Examples include diamond, graphite, and silicon. Lastly, we'll talk about molecular solids, which are held together by intermolecular forces that we discussed back in chapter 11. These forces are weaker than those of other solids, so these compounds usually are soft and have low melting points when compared to those of other solids. Examples include HBr and H2O. In this picture, we see typified, zoomed-in depictions of what these solids would look like up close. In metallic solids, we once again see Many different individual metal nuclei, where the protons and neutrons reside, surrounded by a sea of flowing electrons. In ionic solids, we see clustered together an alternating structure of cations and anions, all pointing at each other in a complementary fashion in all directions. In covalent network solids, we have individual covalent bonds connecting each of the individual atoms to each other in all directions. And in molecular solids, we have separate molecules that are all just sticking together via intermolecular forces that we discussed back in chapter 11. Solids arranged in an orderly repeated pattern are called crystalline solids. Less orderly solids are called amorphous solids, which at the atomic level have structures similar to those of liquids. That brings us to a wondrous problem. What kinds of attractive forces exist between particles in each of the following? 
I'm not going to answer this question for you, but we'll instead let you do it on your own. However, you can consult the discussion I just presented a couple of slides ago to help you determine the answers. Separately, what type or types of crystalline solid is characterized by each of the following descriptions? Once again, I'm not going to answer this for you, but we'll ask you to instead consult the discussion I just presented a couple of slides ago. I'd like to finish this video by talking more about metals. Metals are bonded together, as I already mentioned earlier, through metallic bonds in which the valence electrons are delocalized throughout the entire solid like a sea of electrons among countless islands of individual metallic nuclei. These characteristics cause metals to conduct electricity, be malleable, which means they can be hammered into thin sheets, and to be ductile, which means they can be drawn into wire. Alloys, just so you know, are materials that contain more than one metallic element. They also have metallic properties. So to predict if a compound or element will have metallic properties, you need to consult the periodic table. If the compound is a metallic element or an alloy, which is two or more metals mixed together, then it will have metallic properties. If not, then it won't. That brings us to a wonderful question. From the following substances, circle all that you would expect to possess metallic properties. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll talk to you about unit cells and lattice structures. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.